people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The Sri Lankan crisis is not getting over anytime soon. And these are not anybody's projections or conjectures, but the words of Prime Minister himself. Yes, Ranil Vikramasinghe has appealed to his countrymen to brace themselves for even tougher challenges in times to come. And it is not his system that he is relying on for the recovery, but the foreign assistance that he believes will pull the country out of the crisis. Meanwhile, the doctors too have threatened to join in the protests if the government failed in procuring sufficient medicine stocks amidst a crippled health system. Long queues for almost every essential. Outrage against the government and the establishment's repeated expressions of helplessness. This is the fundamental story of island nation Sri Lanka in the past few weeks. People cutting across every sector, including those working for the government, have hit the streets demanding imprisonment of former Prime Minister and current President Gotabaya Rajapaksa's elder brother Mahinda Rajapaksa. They have also been demanding the resignation of the current cabinet, saying the government has failed miserably at handling any form of crisis. And while the government has denied giving in to the increasing public pressure, the newly appointed Prime Minister, Ranil Vikramasinghe, has further dampened people's morale, saying even more troubling times were yet to surface. He said the country was down to its last day of patrol and Sri Lanka urgently needed $75 million in foreign exchange in the next few days to pay for essential imports. Mama Janata out of Karnu Sangava, Buruki, Mata Kisiset, Kamatine, Bayan Akuat, Aprasan Navu, Meka Yatta Tatwe, Keti Kali Nava, Api Muna Denta Yane, Gevi Kale Tatwada, Duskarma Kale Kata, Mevelave, Aputa Tibene, Duk Kam Katulu Vitari, Eight Me Tatwe Keti Kali Nai, Idirimas a key pedi, Ape Mitra Ratavala Upakare. Saha Sahayogi Apata Labevi Oud Mevan Vitat Apata Udaukaran Porunduela Tieno E Sanda Gatavan Masa Kipe Apata Ivasi Men Daragant in Nama Venua Namut Apita making Godayan Puluam E Sanda Apita Alut Margeka Yanta Venua President Gotabai Rajapaksa, after getting cornered by massive protests that also included some episodes of violence, had replaced his brother with Ranil Vikrama Singhe last week. But that hasn't seemed to calm down Sri Lankans. The protesters have said they will keep up their campaign as long as Gotabai Rajapaksa remains president. They have also labelled Vikrama Singhe a stooge and criticised his appointment of four cabinet ministers, all members of the political party run by the Rajapaksa brothers. Meanwhile, the medical professionals in the Sri Lankan capital, Colombo too, warned of a protest if the government failed in finding a solution to the growing drug shortage in the economic crisis stuck nation. First of all, the drug shortage. That is very important. We need drugs. We need to function our ICUs. We need to function our HDUs. We need to function our uh, wards. There are so many patients awaiting surgeries and all this. Uh, we need to uh, save the lives of our patients. We have declared a strong uh, statement 
saying that if things want uh, rectify and uh, uh, amend according to a collective decision, there will be consequences that uh, the government has to face. Experts who have been thoroughly working on finding the real cause of the current crisis say it all began with the credit rating downgrades in 2020, following which Sri Lanka lost access to foreign commercial borrowing. The central bank reacted by trying to fix an exchange rate of 200 to 203 Sri Lankan rupee to the US dollar, but that didn't apparently pay off. The next step was price controls and the consequences were shortages and forex holding. Meanwhile, the talks with the IMF that are scheduled to last May 24 have turned out fruitful so far as the international body has assured substantial assistance to Sri Lanka. The question, however, is whether the IMF assistance will be enough, whether the supplies coming from India and other countries are going to save Sri Lanka. And last but the most important is, is Sri Lanka ever coming out of the crisis it has plunged into? Or it is set to face economic doom in the coming days? Moving on. Islamabad and Washington have signaled towards resetting of ties as Pakistan Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari met U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at U.N. headquarters this week. After witnessing a rapid deterioration in bilateral ties during Imran Khan regime, the two sides discussed about strengthening their economic and commercial ties. Besides regional equations, the two sides also discussed Afghan stability, support for Ukraine and democratic principles. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met Pakistani Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari at the United Nations as the United States kicked off its presidency of the Security Council with a series of meetings addressing global food security. It was the first meeting between Blinken and Zardari, who was named Foreign Minister by the new Western-friendly Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif, who came to power in April after his predecessor Imran Khan was ousted in a no-confidence vote. Zardari said that Pakistan was willing to improve its ties with Washington at bilateral level and his country respected all bilateral relationships Washington has in the region. Pakistan uh, is not insecure about our relationship with the United States and we believe that the world is big enough for both Pakistan and India uh, to exist. Uh, so uh, we see that the United States has absolutely got its own relationship with the uh, government of India, with the people of India, but the, but the United States also has its own relationship with Pakistan and the people of Pakistan. Uh, and um, regardless of the trajectory uh, of US um, India relations, I believe that there is a lot of potential for Pakistan-US uh, relations and it is in the benefit, it is to the benefit of the people of Pakistan and the people of America that both our governments engage uh, and we look uh, to provide opportunities uh, to both our people uh, to benefit from our relationship. The meeting came at a time when the world is discussing ways to stop the Russia-Ukraine war and food security is appearing to be a looming international threat. Zardari and Blinken discussed issues surrounding food securities and strengthening economic ties between the two countries. So we're coming together and I'm grateful for Pakistan's participation and uh, engagement on this. Uh, to look at concrete steps we can take to um, address the food and security issues, uh, to uh, help people in need uh, around the world. But beyond that, uh, this is an important opportunity for us to uh, talk about uh, the many issues we're working together. We want to focus on uh, the work we're doing to strengthen our economic and commercial ties between the United States and Pakistan. Of course, uh, focus on regional security. 
And Pakistan is now in the chairmanship of the G77, and the United States uh, is looking forward to strengthening uh, our own uh, relations and, uh, and dialogue and communication with the G77. Experts analyzed that the tone and tenor of the meeting was reflective of the Pakistani intention of repairing the ties that have received a major dent since former Prime Minister Imran Khan's allegations that the U.S. had engineered his ouster. Khan has gone on an accusation spree since he lost the no-confidence motion and has even said that a conspiracy was being hatched to eliminate him. Shahbaz Sharif-led government has however refuted all allegations and has also been investigating into the charges that have already been termed baseless by powerful Pakistan military. Experts also believe that Pakistan should be working more towards reviving its economy, which has received further blows since Russia-Ukraine war broke out. Moving on. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Nepalese counterpart Sher Bahadur Dioba held a bilateral meeting in Lumbini this week on the anniversary of Gautam Buddha. Prime Ministers continued their discussion from where they left last month when Dioba had visited India and discussed specific initiatives and ideas to further strengthen cooperation in various sectors including culture, economy, trade, connectivity, energy and development partnership. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Lumbini in Nepal this week to mark the anniversary of Lord Gautam Buddha and further emphasize on the deepening India-Nepal ties. Modi, accompanied by Deuba, also offered prayers at the Maya Devi Temple, the site where Buddha was born. In the Indian Prime Minister's fifth visit to the Himalayan nation, Modi and Deuba also laid the foundation stone for a centre for Buddhist culture and heritage. Nepal and India share strong cultural and traditional ties, with Buddhism being one of the common cultural points. Lord Buddha, who was born in Lumbini in Nepal, attained enlightenment in Bodh Gaya, which is in India. The two sides agreed in principle to establish sister city relations between Lumbini and Kushinagar which are among the holiest sites of Buddhism and reflect the shared Buddhist heritage between the two countries. India and Nepal signed six agreements to boost cultural ties after Prime Minister Narendra Modi held talks with his Nepalese counterpart Sher Bahadur Deuba. Modi stressed the need for further depth in the bilateral ties of both countries and said that together they have the potential of guiding the evolving world order. ये सांझी विरासत, ये सांझी संस्कृति, ये सांझी आस्था और ये सांझा प्रेम यही हमारी सबसे बड़ी पूंजी है और ये पूंजी जितनी समृद्ध होगी हम उतने ही प्रभावी ढंग से साथ मिलकर दुनिया तक भगवान बुद्ध का संदेश पहुंचा सकते हैं दुनिया को दिशा दे सकते हैं आज जिस तरह की वैश्विक परिस्थितियां बन रही हैं उसमें भारत और नेपाल की निरंतर मजबूती होती मित्रता हमारी घनिष्ठता
India has played an instrumental role in rebuilding Nepal post-2015 earthquake and has provided different forms of assistance under its neighbourhood policy. Under the same line, an MOU between Satluj Jalavidyut Nigam, a Himachal government subsidiary, and Nepal Electricity Authority for a 695-megawatt Arun 4 power project was signed, under which Nepal will receive 152 megawatt of free electricity under a sharing arrangement. India has maintained that it seeks a stable and prosperous neighbourhood, and Nepal, which has been its ally since forever, even before official diplomatic ties were established, has been the key beneficiary of the projects New Delhi has floated under its neighbourhood policies. From railways to gas lines and from trade to integrated check posts, India has consistently supported Nepal's development and in Prime Minister Modi's words, India and Nepal have always shared a special relationship and will continue to have it in future. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. World leaders descended on the United Arab Emirates past week to offer condolences to new leader Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan on the death of his half-brother President Khalifa bin Zayed in a show of support to a key regional player. Sheikh Mohammed, now ruler of wealthy Abu Dhabi Emirate, steered the Western Allied Gulf state, an OPEC oil producer and regional business hub for years, before being named the UAE's third president by a federal Supreme Council. US President Joe Biden, whose administration has had fraught ties with the UAE and Saudi Arabia, was represented by Vice President Kamala Harris. Britain's Prince William and the Duke of Cambridge paid respects on behalf of Britain's Queen Elizabeth. From Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to French President Emmanuel Macron, leaders from across the world also sent their condolences to UAE. Khalifa, born in 1948, had rarely been seen in public since suffering a stroke in 2014. He was buried and funeral prayers were held last Friday on 13th May. A heavy sandstorm in Iraq, the latest of what Iraqis say is an unprecedented number to hit the country in recent weeks, closed some state schools and offices and halted flights at Baghdad International Airport this week. Authorities in Baghdad, including the Education Ministry, declared a day off for local government institutions, with the exception of health services. Hundreds of people across the capital and southern cities went to hospitals with breathing difficulties, medical officials said. At least one sandstorm a week has hit Iraq in past few weeks in what Iraqis say is the worst such spate in living memory. In Baghdad and southern Iraqi cities, a red haze of dust and sand reduced visibility to just a few hundred feet. According to the United Nations, Iraq is the fifth most vulnerable country in the world to climate crisis. Drought and extreme temperatures are drying up farmland and making large parts of Iraq barely habitable during the summer months. The country posted record temperatures of at least 52 degrees Celsius in recent years. Japanese company Rinnai is launching its production unit in Georgia in North America with an aim to expand the production and dissemination of its latest product, tankless water heater. The tankless water heater makes sure that there is no shortage of hot water. When it comes to the tankless technology in North America, there are two technologies. <clears throat> There's condensing and non-condensing. The condensing is a higher efficiency product that is sold north of the Mason-Dixon line or in the northern part of the United States. Non-condensing is sold in the southern part of the United States. And Renai America has both technologies. So we have product that we sell in both segments that allows us to support both the residential and the commercial marketplace. 
Rinai's motto is creating a healthier way of living. Its water heater contributes towards making a more comfortable life for citizens around the world. Marunouchi is a commercial district in Tokyo which is witnessing massive development. To promote its commercial activities, Mitsubishi Estate hosted a music festival. Professional musicians performed at number of places to entertain the visitors. Mitsubishi Estate is developing office buildings in Marunouchi area. The company even provided square of Mitsubishi Estate's building for the concert stage. Additionally, in each season, symbolic events are held to contribute to sightseeing. For example, Saman Bon Audrey Dance and Winter Christmas Event. Mitsubishi Estate is energizing the area by developing a town dedicated to office workers as well as tourists. Moving on. Thousands of devotees flocked to India's pilgrimage sites and temples this week to mark Lord Buddha's 2566th anniversary. The holy town of Bodh Gaya in eastern Bihar state opened its gate to an international crowd after two years of pandemic. Bodh Gaya is revered by the Buddhists since Lord Buddha is believed to have attained enlightenment under a tree at this place. Tens of hundreds of devotees from the world over congregated at Bodh Gaya in the Indian state of Bihar to mark the 2566th anniversary of Lord Buddha. They prayed and offered sweets and fruits before the statue of Lord Buddha. Like every other Buddha Purnima, sermons on the life and teachings of Buddha were held and attended by followers. Devotees say the day holds a great significance in their life as Lord Buddha had attained enlightenment on this day at this place only. Ask a Buddha Janti had 2566 Buddha Janti Maraha. Ask a Jodin Meha, the one Buddha Nikyam Pratokia. Also known as Buddha Janti or Vesak. The festival of Buddha Purnima is based on the Asian Luli solar calendar. People usually dress in white, do not consume non-vegetarian foods and distribute kheer as according to Buddhist lore. On this day, a woman named Sujata had offered Buddha a bowl of milk porridge. The relics of Buddha are taken out for public display in a procession. Many Hindus also believe Buddha to be the ninth incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Devotees say they are bestowed with peace and happiness by Lord Buddha. We have come to the church with the family. Today is a very important day. Here, the peace of the church is filled with peace and the peace of the church is filled with peace. The life of Gautam Buddha began in Lumbini in Nepal. Born into an aristocratic family, Lord Buddha left home at the age of 29 in search for the meaning of life. In his quest, he traveled to many places until finally attaining enlightenment in Bodh Gaya under the Mahabodhi tree that still stands today in Bihar in India. Buddha, who gained enlightenment at the age of 35, went on preaching the meaning of life and today stands as one of the leading spiritual figures in the world. Many followers also free caged birds on this day as a symbol of empathy and compassion for all living beings. What are the most important teachings of Lord Buddha? With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.